We are in part number 81 in our series, The Perfect Person of God, a study in Matthew's Gospel. Uh, the last couple of weeks we've been discussing the concept of love. Um, Jesus was asked the question, what is the greatest commandment? And, and his answer is what? Okay, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as you love yourself. Well, there was a question last week, and, and I, 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 we said that we're not going to be able to deal with it last week because it was just too big of a question. Um, how do you love people who are absolutely unlovable? And I'm not talking about your common, ordinary, annoying person at the gas station. You know better than that, right? I'm talking about, we're talking about people on the extremes. I think the example that, you, that almost always gets used when we talk about things like, how do you love extreme racists, Nazis? How do you love people? How, how, that was the question that was posed to uh, us. How do we love people on those margins? But remember, Jesus uh, all said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, uh, and then uh, we can add to that strength. He also said, love your neighbor as yourself. But do you remember what he said in Matthew's God, uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 34, or 43 and 40, through 45? You shouldn't have to look it up. What did he also say? Love your who? Who? Your enemies. Love your enemies. And bless those who curse you. So Jesus concept of the arena of love is very, very wide, very, very broad. That said, what does it mean to love anyone? So this is where we get back to this very definition of, of love. One of the, the passages of scripture that gets uh, most often quoted by non-Christians who still want to claim some sort of spirituality is this idea that God is love. You've heard this, right? I hope you have because it's in the Bible. 1 John chapter 4, verse 16, when John is writing about the concept of, of Christian love, he points back to God. He says, God is love. So it's obviously important what we think about love, because even God uses as a, as a defining qualification of who he is as love. But it bears uh, thinking through how does God being love and our version of love, how do they coincide? So when we say we love somebody, what does that look like? When, we, when human beings say they love somebody, what does that look like? Okay, so good romance. All right. That's one, one area, right? What else? Say again, family. Okay. Now we're getting some place commitment. What else? This is really sad. Some of you people have been married for decades and decades and decades and decades, and you can't give me more than three words about love. Cherish. Cherish. Okay, Mary Lib, what is cherish? What does it mean to cherish something? To love it. <laughs> now we're getting circular, right? Okay, so unpack some of these a little bit more. Okay, now, okay, now we're getting there. Getting a little bit. These are all good. Understanding. Okay, wisdom. Acceptance. Uh, it's twice I hear patience. I'm sure you could say amen to that, patience. Say that one again. Forgiveness. Ooh, see, now we're, now we're getting to the heart of how you guys have stayed married so long. Patience and forgiveness. Yeah, so as you get to know somebody and love them longer and longer and longer, you realize how significant some of these things are. All right. Now, I'm asking you, uh, I, I'm assuming for the most part, you are all uh, have been 
believers, believers in Jesus for a great amount of time, a long, a long amount of time. And so your definition of love for your family, your love for your spouse, your, your love for your, your community is, is kind of uh, seen through the grid of your faith. Is that, would I, is that an accurate statement? Your definition is kind of, you know, influenced by your faith. At least I hope it is. That said, the one, the one I'm going to highlight for just a second is, is one that a couple of these can also be used by people who are not believers. This concept of acceptance, okay, cherishing, romance, these are all things that non-believers would look at and say, yeah, that's love. Now, it's also appropriate for believers to think that as well. Okay, I'm not diminishing the concept of romance and cherishing and acceptance. However, when these things are taken out of the, the, the mindset of faith, what we begin to have is a distortion of what godly love it looks like. Again, I want to say this so that nobody goes out of this room saying Zach thinks that Christianity is not romantic. Okay, that married people should have no romance if they're Christian. That's not what I'm saying. Should, absolutely. Take your spouse out, have dates, okay? Do those sorts of things, okay? But, and, and, and acceptance, also important in the Christian definition of love. However, if you divorce the faith in Jesus Christ from romance, cherishing, uh, acceptance, what, you, what can happen when it's distorted is it becomes... Uh, when it, it can become a very um, selfish thing. What do I mean by that? How does love become selfish? Pride. There was a word that was in, on that list and, 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 and it came up and it was really a good one. Um, that is, is a necessary corrective, but it's, it takes the eyes of faith to get there. And it was the word sacrifice. Terry, did you say sacrifice? Yeah. Do you know why the divorce rate is so high in this country? It's not easy to do, by the way. It's easier than it used to be, but it's still not easy. It's because the desire for selfish acceptance, romance, and cherishing has, been, has replaced commitment and sacrifice. The highest good in, in those relationships is what do I get out of it, right? It's me over we. I didn't just make that up. That's actually something I talk about in pre-marriage counseling. It's what, if I, don't, if I don't get the feelings anymore, then I'm out. When you take that to non, non kind of romantic relationships, this idea of cherishing and acceptance, what it does also... And again, without the eyes of faith, is it says to people, whatever you do is okay. Because I just accept you because I love you. No matter who you are, no matter what you are. And when you take that de de definition of love, and you apply it to the question of how do you love extreme racists and Nazis, you can't do it. Because to love an enemy does not mean to say yes to everything that they believe in. Or to agree wholesale with a given lifestyle or a trajectory of behavior. That is not the loving thing to do in God's economy. To say that God is love... We have to understand that God's love and, and the definition that can be applied to God as love is not the human uh, uh, equivalent. Now, if you have the eyes of faith, if you have the eyes of Jesus Christ, then it does get a lot closer. But do you know what attribute is? So we always look at, uh, we'll say we, not we, other people, not us. We don't do this. Elevate the attribute of God as love as being the highest of all of God's attributes. Do you agree with that or not agree with that? So I'm going to give you a, I'm going to give you a clue. You should not agree with that. Do you know the only attribute of God that's repeated three times in succession? 
to add emphasis to how important it is? Do you know what it is? You sing it in a hymn. Holy. Holy, holy, holy. There's two, uh, it happens multiple times, but there's two primary uh, um, kind of scenes where we see or we hear uh, God proclaimed as holy. One is in Isaiah chapter, uh, is in Isaiah chapter um, 6 verse 3. In Isaiah chapter 6 verse 3, the prophet Isaiah is being called to be a prophet. He, he finds himself He's in the temple, but he finds himself in the temple that's being transformed into the actual throne room of God. And the train of the robe of God is so big that it fills the entire space. And there are angels flying around, and each angel has, has, has six wings. Did you know this? Six wings. Well, every time we see paintings of angels with th two wings, it's wrong. They have six. One, they cover their eyes. One, they cover their feet. Or one pair, they cover their eyes. One pair, they cover their feet. And the other, they fly. Why would they cover their, head, their eyes and their feet? They can't look at God. But all day long, do you know what they sing? Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The earth is filled with his glory. We see this scene almost identical again in, in the book of Revelation in chapter 4 verse 8 where John is transported to the throne room of God and he sees the 24 elders around the throne the 24 being representation of the 12 disciples and the 12 uh, tribes of Israel, the complete governance of all the earth, of the holy governance of all the earth surrounding the throne. There are angels there present, and you know what they sing all day long? Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Holy, holy, holy. God is love, for sure, but God is holy love. What does holy mean? We're getting there. The original question is how do we love people on the margins? The top attribute of God is not love. It's this, holiness. Now God is love. But all of the other attributes of God are defined by holy. What does holy mean? Separate or different. Separate or different indicate a contrast. Separate or different from what? From everything common or ordinary, everything that's like us. So when we start to define love by God's terms we got to go back to the holiness of God and go back to God's terms. And sometimes God expresses his love in some pretty odd ways. Such as justice. We always think of love being compassion and mercy, which it is. But that's not all that it is. Sometimes God's love is expressed through justice. When you, you, you have children, um, your child continue, continually makes the same moral mistake over and over and over again, what do you do? What's the loving thing to do? Correct. Correct. Discipline, right? It's discipline. That's justice. That's a, that's a, that's a justice thing. World's definition of love, the, the common, ordinary, non-holy, non-different definition of love is to say, no, 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 just accept little Timmy for who he is. Timmy's a kid. He doesn't know anything. He hasn't learned what right and wrong is. He doesn't understand the consequences of his actions. Timmy is morally stupid. And that's okay, because you and I were morally stupid too. And somebody had to correct us. The loving thing to do is to correct and to discipline, right? The non-loving thing to do, the lazy thing to do, is to let little Timmy be however he wants to be. I realize that's on camera now. And you could take that any old way you want to. It can lead to the death of people. 
It can't. Well, now again, that's, that, that becomes, a, becomes a quandary between God's economy and our economy. See, now, there are times when God, in justice, destroys people, right? Do we have the same power? That becomes a debate for our, the, the, the back and forth between what, what, what's, what's our power, what's, what's God's, what is reserved for God's power only in justice, and what's given to us in God's, you know, what has God stewarded us with? Has God stewarded us with the giving and taking of life? It was. Because you know about in the in in the promised land. Yeah. So in the promised land, or in we'll look at in the book of Exodus, for example. The book of Exodus, for example, what what does God treat Pharaoh with a, in a loving way? Does God treat the people in Noah's time in a loving way? God is love. Does that change? God does not change. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So if God is love, did God treat the people in Noah's day in love? He cannot stand sin. He, out of love, enacted justice on people who had deserved justice. Now you say, well, wait a minute. That doesn't seem fair. You're right. It's not fair. Praise God, he does not treat us fairly. Love and fairness are not the same thing. If God treated us fairly, who else would have died in the time of Noah? Noah. And Sham and Ham and Japheth and Noah's wife who goes unnamed. And all the animals. Did God treat Pharaoh and the Egyptians in a loving way in the book of Exodus? Absolutely he did. There is a chance. Now, we don't have time to get into the Presbyterian view that in all things, it's, you know, there's the, he, the, the fact is, we know God is love, but his love is by definition different than ours. Treating someone out of love does not mean you let them do whatever they want to do and you let sin go unchecked. As human beings, we have to understand that we ourselves are corrupted by sin. Even in relationship to Jesus Christ, we're corrupted by sin. And our judgment of who deserves punishment and who doesn't deserve punishment has to be uh, made in the context of a fair amount of prayer and community. Because the stewardship of life and death is not ours, it's God's. And so if we take a person's life out of justice, we better be darn well sure we've got the power to do so. Otherwise, we fall into sin. But so circle back to the original question is what do you do? How do you love your physical neighbor who might be a Nazi or extreme racist or an abuser or a something worse you pray to god he gives them justice because what does paul say in the book of romans vengeance is mine says the lord and when we're and when we are put in a position to enact justice we pray for ourselves and the community around them to do so wisely and ourselves justly, right? Not out of vengeance or revenge. Yeah, Bob. If you see someone in an abusive relationship doing something that is absolutely abusive to other people, to other whatever, you turn them into the authorities. That is the... the loving thing to do with the hope that and the prayer that they will be corrected and turn and see their ways and hopeful and prayerfully come to faith in jesus christ and be repentant that that's the that's the ultimate prayer right the ultimate prayer is that those who are what we consider the grievous of sinners 
would find the light of Jesus Christ and turn and, and, and be transformed and changed. Because what, what more powerful witness to the, to the gospel of Jesus Christ than what we consider an extreme sinner to be saved? I mean, that's, that's the power of God. And lest we feel too, uh, too good about ourselves, because you guys don't come here for me to make you feel good about yourself. I, I hope you realize that now. Uh, how many of us deserve destruction? Including all of us. So we are, with apart from Jesus Christ, in the exact same boat as the extreme racist, the abuser, the Nazi. Ultimate destruction. That's hard pill to swallow. Now, in this room, and I don't mean this tongue-in-cheek, I mean this literally, we have come to faith in Jesus Christ. We understand the depth of our sin and the need for salvation. And we understand that out of love, God enacted all of the justice that was owed for our sin on his own shoulders in Jesus Christ. He put that on Jesus. He put it on himself. Right? That's the power of the love of God. The love of God does not turn a blind eye to sinfulness or to justice or to truth. In fact, it embraces it. And, and when we fail, we know that the justice has been satisfied in Jesus so that we can, in love, relate to other people who also need the forgiveness and mercy and justice and compassion of Jesus Christ. That doesn't mean we accept their behavior. Absolutely not. But we prayerfully consider how we might exhibit the truth, the mercy, the justice of God. It is, George, you're right, absolutely complicated. <laughs> yeah. Yep. No, it, it, the definition of love did not change, but what did change is how that justice was satisfied. So the justice was satisfied now in Jesus Christ. God took the justice on his own shoulders. And it was always the plan to do that, but again, Understanding the depth of sin and what, what we deserve. What we deserve is what the Egyptians got. What we deserve is what the other people in, in Noah's time got. We deserve destruction. We deserve the flood. We deserve the plagues. That's what we deserve. And you look at that and go, wow, that's, that's a lot of pawns to teach us a lesson and to teach every other human being on the face of the planet a lesson. But that's the, that's the prerogative of Almighty God. It didn't change, but what did change is that there's an avenue for, for the justice to be satisfied in a single sacrifice. The Jewish people had that justice baked into their, into their, uh, um, into their religious system as well. How was justice satisfied before Christ? In the sacrificial system, the, the animal sacrifices. This is what the book of Hebrews is all about, right? The book of Hebrews is all about tying in the, the Old Testament uh, Jewish practices with the, the tabernacle and the sacrifices and the priestly system and saying how all of those things, all in that time, were meant to satisfy the justice of Jesus and, the, and because of the sinfulness of the people and how all of that is completed and fulfilled in Jesus. They had, they had an atonement opportunity. It's just they had to keep doing it over and 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 over again. I know that's not easy. Those are not, because we, we get, we get very, um, and it shouldn't be easy for us. Because if it's easy for us, then we haven't taken the love of God seriously and we haven't remembered, uh, George, like you said, the, di the, the commonness of our definition and the holiness of God's definition. And it sh so it should feel in our gut a little, there should be a little bit of angstiness, which means we wrestle with these issues. 
I think sometimes we look for uh, this feeling of, oh, I know what to do in every situation and to be totally God-honoring. I know what to do. I know I, I, I chase for that feeling, that I know in every situation exactly what God requires of me, and I'm going to do it, and I'm going to feel great about it. I chase that. Guess what? It ain't going to happen. We're going to, we have to wrestle with it. That's what we do here. We wrestle with it on this side of eternity. And the wrestling is good. That feeling of uneasiness, I'm not really sure what to do, but I'm going to be prayer, prayerfully uh, considering it. I'm going to go back to God's word. I'm going to go into a community of faith and we're going to talk about it. That's good. Because it, it, it's, it, there's humility there. As soon as you feel like you're, you got it figured out, first of all, come talk to me and we're going to go to counseling. Because I guarantee you, you don't. I, I'm not, not putting my... When I feel like I got it figured out, I know something bad's going to happen because I know God's going to say, no, you don't. No, you don't. It's, that's the humility piece. Right. You know, when, when I'm growing up, I heard my mother tell me many, many times, love me always, and at this moment, I don't like it. Yeah. And, oh, yeah, now. Nah. I think that's just kind of. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think you're right, Carolyn. And I think, I think, we've, I think culturally, we've lost that, that it's okay to be disappointed in people that we love and let them know we're disappointed in the people that we love, but still love them. See, we like equate the good feelings with love and the, and love can bring good feelings. That's not to say, you know, but it's just that if love is only defined by the good feelings, I also like you if then love is pretty thin. The love should be way deeper. Like your, like your mom, like the liking you know, I don't like myself some days, right? But Jesus didn't say love your, like your neighbor as you like yourself. He said love your neighbor as you love yourself. Okay, enough of that. Um, Jesus did have love for the religious leaders. And this is, this is difficult because we think about Jesus and the, the religious leaders having all this incredible conflict with one another, and they did. They had made Jesus their enemies. And yet Jesus still loved them. But how did Jesus express his love to the religious leaders? Through conflict. Through back and forth. They, they, had, they had questioned his authority. If you remember, we go back to the, to the triumphal entry he rides in on the donkey's colt. He goes into the, the, the temple. He turns the tables. He heals. He teaches. And they say, by what authority? And then they start, ha then they, that kicks off this kind of back and forth where uh, Jesus doesn't answer their questions. He points back to John the Baptist. And then he tells these series of parables that, that uh, basically questions and undermines their own authority. And then they begin to try to trap Jesus through this series of questions. Uh, what should we do about taxes, right? What, what, what's the deal with the marriage and the resurrection? Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? And they're trying to, all the time, trap him, test him, uh, diminish his popularity with the crowd, get him in trouble with the Roman officials, uh, paint him as just a common, ordinary rabbi. Uh, they, they try all these different tactics and, and yet Jesus in love pushes back against them uh, in these conflicts to help them see and also help others see uh, what he really came to do. So then we moved to uh, the, the back half of uh, Matthew chapter 22. So let's look at Matthew chapter 22. We'll start with verse uh, 41. Starting with verse 41. Now, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? They said to him, The son of David. And he said to them, How is it then that David in the spirit calls him Lord? The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. 
If then David calls him Lord, how is he his son? And no one was able to answer him a word. Nor from that day did anyone dare to ask him any more questions. So we have this scene where there is a reversal of roles. Because up to this point, it's, it's the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Herodians. They're the ones approaching Jesus with the question. But here, Jesus returns with a, a, a question. And he is doing this to kind of reverse tactic a little bit. He's actually testing them in front of the crowd. Um, you remember in, in the previous section uh, in Matthew 21, 24, he's, he's employed this a little bit. When they ask him about his authority, he asks them about the authority of John the Baptist. He, he, he does this, but this time he is actually instigating the question. They're not questioning him at this point. It seems like a little time has passed from the question about love, but it's still in that same arena. Uh, and now he's kind of directing uh, an attention to them. And he's doing so to demonstrate that the religious leaders don't understand their own, their own laws. They don't understand their own, um, their own uh, the scriptures. He's not... Some people get confused about this because they think, is Jesus diminishing the connection between the Messiah himself and David. That's not what he's doing. He's doing it to show that the religious leaders have no idea how that connection works. Now, in Luke's account and in Mark's account, uh, there, it's, there is a, um, there's a, a little bit of a, a difference. Uh, if you go to Mark chapter 12, verse 35 through 37, or Luke chapter 20, verses 41 through 44, there is uh, no response at all from the religious leaders. They just go silent. But Matthew's purpose here is to show the limitations of the leaders. He puts the right words in their mouths. But they still have a lack of appreciation for the impact. Jesus is a son of David. So he fits their criteria, but they don't understand really all the nuance of what it means to be uh, the Messiah. So Jesus' question uh, really is one about identity. What is the identity of the Messiah? Whose son is the Messiah? Now, it seems like a straightforward kind of question with a straightforward origin, but as Jesus begins to unpack the quote from Psalm 110, it's definitely more complicated than that. Now, the religious leaders... Um, held to the response that they gave, that the son of, of, of the Messiah, um, the Christ, is the son of David. Now they get this because they, they do understand at least the human lineage side of uh, the Messiah. In 2 Samuel uh, chapter 7, verse 13 and 14, God makes a promise. This is what we think of as the Davidic covenant. Uh, if you think the whole story, David has a goal when he becomes king. He's defeated all of his enemies or most of his enemies at this point early on in his reign of both Israel and Judah. He's living in a palace, but the people of God still worship God in the tabernacle. What's the tabernacle? What's it made out of? It's a tent. It's, it's made out of skins. It's made out of a tapestries. It's, it's, a, it's a movable tent. And David looks at this and says, um, this isn't right. I'm living in a big palace and God is worshipped in a tent. That seems weird to me, to build a mansion while the church is outdoors. And you, that seems like a very, uh, that's a noble thing, right? To honor God by building a big building uh, for him. And, and in fact, when David goes and talks to Nathan, the, his prophet, Nathan says, go do it. And then God goes right to David and says, pump the brakes. That's not going to happen. It's going to happen, but it's not happening yet. He then says his son is gonna, going to um, actually build the temple. But in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 13 and 14, uh, God speaks to David directly. And he says, he shall uh, build a house for my name. He's talking about uh, 
in the immediate, he's talking about Solomon, but he's really talking about a, a, further, um, a further fulfillment of this prophecy in uh, Jesus Christ. I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. When he commits iniquity, and this is where it's really just applying to Solomon and the offspring, I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the son of men. Now, Isaiah picks up this theme of the Messiah uh, in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1, and then verse 10. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse. Who's David's dad? Jesse. And from a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. In that day, the root of Jesse shall stand as a signal for the peoples. Of him shall the nations inquire, and his resting place shall be glorious. Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 5. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as a king and deal wisely, and he shall ex execute justice and righteousness in the land. The religious leaders, when they're asked this question, they know all of these passages of Scripture. They know all of the prophecies. They know what God himself said to David. And, and for the Pharisees specifically, the tendency then was to think of the Messiah in strictly governmental or civil terms. Because David, what was his role? What, what, what was the office that he held? He was the king. So they, they tended to think the Messiah was coming to be the king exclusively. That he was coming to reestablish the geopolitical reality of Israel. And so this created sort of a revolutionary bent in the expectations of the Messiah. This is one of the reasons that the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Herodians were a little bit nervous about this because they had gotten themselves in, in a pretty good position with the imperial government of Rome. Rome was allowing them to worship, for the most part, not extensive, not as extensively as they would have liked, but for the most part, they were getting to worship the way they wanted to worship. So what if they had a Roman governor? At least the Roman governor claimed to be Jewish. Uh, they had known 400 years previous to this where it had been a lot worse. And so this idea that the Messiah was coming to be a civic and governmental leader, you know, meant, meant a revolution. It meant a civil war. And some people in Jesus' day were longing for that. They were zealots for it. They created riots for it. And every single one of those riots was squashed by the Roman government. And so there's, from a positive standpoint, the Pharisees, the Herodians, the, the Sadducees, they did not want to see a, a, re a revolution that would cost people lives. They thought we're in a pretty good spot. And so they had this kind of picture of the Messiah in very revolutionary terms. And, and for those that had that but were longing for the Messiah, really longing for it, when they looked at Jesus, they were disappointed because Jesus did not come and raise an army. He did not come and, and bring the chariots and the horses. Now, did Jesus come to be the king after the line of David? Yes, but it was a different type of kingdom and it was a broader type of kingdom. And so after the Pharisees return with the answer, the, the, the son is the son of David. Jesus then quotes from Psalm 110. He asks this question, how is it that David calls his son Lord? So I'm going to read from Psalm 110 just a second because Psalm 110 is the most quoted Old Testament passage in the New Testament. Psalm 110 is quoted more than any other Old Testament passage. So Psalm 110 goes like this, and you'll, you'll hear different verses. You're like, oh, wait, this is said here, and this is said here. The Lord says to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter. Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power in holy garments. From the womb of the morning, the dew of your youth will be yours. 
The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Hello, that's from the book of Hebrews. The Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter kings on the day of his wrath. He will execute judgment among the nations, filling them with corpses. He will shatter chiefs over the wide earth. He will drink from the brook by the way before he will lift up his head. This chapter brings together a lot about uh, the Messiah. It brings together the kingship of the Messiah, the sovereignty of God in the Messiah, the priesthood of the Messiah, and the intercession, uh, the intercessory nature of the Messiah. The authority of God over the brokenness of the kingdoms of the world. That's what Psalm 110 is all about. It is a kingship uh, psalm. And so when the Jewish teachers uh, challenged their hearers to solve different discrepancies in Scripture, they assumed that the text was true. So when Jesus is, ask, is challenging the interpretation, when Jesus is challenging their interpretation, he's not doing so to undercut the truthfulness of it. He's trying to get them to think through it differently or to or to expose that they haven't thought through it. He's not saying it's not true. They all assume it's true. This is not like Jesus talking, this is not like an atheist talking to, to uh, the Jewish leaders. This is not how like a, a, a scholar, uh, a secular scholar today is trying to undercut by saying, well, how does this work? You know, uh, because they're trying to undercut the authority. That's not what Jesus is doing at all. Jesus knows that he is both David's son and David's Lord. He knows how it works. He was just asking the leaders to harmonize it. And so Jesus and the religious leaders look at this passage. They all assume, by the way, that David wrote this, which we have in most of our superscriptions. It was common knowledge and one that was affirmed uh, of Jesus throughout Matthew, that Jesus is pointing out that David, by the Spirit and under the influence of God's wisdom, calls his son Lord. Now, this was something that the Jewish people had a hard time with because it was antithetical to their understanding of familiar relationships. If they were looking at this purely in human terms, who should be calling whom Lord? It should be the son calling David, Lord, if you're looking at it in purely human family tree lineage, you're mapping it all out. Every uh, every um, descendant should call the 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 their forebearers Lord, because there's a supremacy of order chronology, and that is how the Jewish people saw their own their own kind of family structures. But Jesus is saying. That both things are true here. That the son can be called Lord by David and still be the son. And, and he wants to have the leaders reconcile this knowing that they have it in their back of their minds. All this about the Messiah coming from the line of David and the commandment, honor your father and your mother. Jesus knows it's not uh, a contradiction and has already demonstrated that he is both, as the Messiah, he's human from the line of David, but he's also divine. And this is how David can call his son Lord, because his son also has to be divine. And for Jesus, this is one of the reasons that Peter's confession when Jesus asks the question, uh, who do the people say that I am? And they only answer in human terms. You're Elijah, you're one of the prophets, you're John the Baptist, come back from the dead. And then when Jesus turns around and asks Peter, but who do you say that I am? He does not notice Peter's confession. And this is in Matthew chapter 16. G Peter's confession is not only Jesus, you are the Christ, period. That's not what he says. He does say that, but he, sa he adds a very critical element to this. You are the Christ, what? What comes next? The son of the living God. He puts the, the Christ part, which has a human aspect to it, has the Davidic lineage to it. 
but also the Messiah is the Son of the living God. And this is why Jesus, in his praising of Peter, says, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but only my Father who's in heaven, because he knows the religious leaders haven't twigged this. And you can tell because when he asked this question, they got half of it right. Their statement is true, but it's half true. It's not completely true. Um, Peter, by the way, makes a, a, an explicit connection between Jesus and the Son of David, and Jesus being the Son of David, um, in uh, the early in the ser- the first sermon of the early church. If you look at Acts chapter two, verse twenty-two, I was going to read it, but I'm not going to. But I do encourage you um, to read Acts two. Uh, in Peter's confession, uh, when he's preaching the first church of the first sermon of the church, uh, he makes a, an explicit point to highlight the Davidic relationship between Jesus. Um, Matthew has a has a real bent on proving Jesus as the son of David um, because his concern for the Old Testament promises and prophecies are are paramount to him. Uh, but he's also the completion of those promises and the prophets. And so it's very important for us today to understand that in this state, in these statements that Jesus is making, he's affirming that he that Jesus is both fully human and fully God. How much human is he? What percentage? God's math is weird. How much God is Jesus? The Jewish leaders cannot comprehend this. Early church heretics could not comprehend this. It's hard for sometimes us to comprehend this. Uh, I'll tell a quick story. We did a a children's thing, a children's reading of the, the... Christmas story. We've done that for several years in the 530 service. And the very first year, I I, I don't know who wrote it, um, but I can't remember the line. I'll have to go get it at some point. But um, there was a line in there and it made me cringe in my seat because it, it made it seem like Jesus was just appeared to be man. I can't remember exactly what the word is. So the story's not that as strong as it, it was in my head. But there was this moment where I'm like, I almost wanted to stand up right in the middle of the Christmas Eve service and stop him and go, that's wrong. <laughs> I couldn't do it because my daughter was in it. So I'm like, yeah, yeah. But I did rewrite it for the next year. I, I told him, I said, guys, we cannot. That's abs- Theologically, that is garbage. God, fully God, fully man. 100%, we cannot make a, and it has to be this way. For the justice of God to be satisfied by the love of God, Jesus has to be fully human. Otherwise, the justice is not satisfied. As a result of Jesus' statement, Matthew puts a little period at the end of this sentence, this, 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 this conflict uh, back and forth, by saying that the religious leaders shut up from then on out with Jesus face to face. Now they didn't shut up because they they start raising all sorts of ruckus and they start con- having a conspiracy about how to 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 deal with Jesus overall or it ramps up. It's actually already begun. We know that they already started looking for a way to silence Jesus, but but now they're not going to confront him directly. No more. Um and it's very much in keeping with how the, 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 the lineage or the forebearers of the Jewish leaders treated the prophets. They treated the prophets in the same way. The prophets said something they didn't like and they killed them. The prophet acted in a way they didn't like and they, they killed them. Jesus will continue as a prophet, even though they're not having a direct conflict with one another, he will continue to point out their insufficiencies. But they will not... Uh, directly uh, confront him until the cross. All right, well, let's pray. 
And uh, save your questions for next week because uh, I got to get over to classic service today. So I got to get a robe on and change the thing. So let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you for this day, for um, your uh, grace, your love, your mercy, but also your justice and your truth that was demonstrated in, in, in the love that, that Jesus shown us in his sacrifice on the cross. Move in our hearts and our minds that we might know how to to live out your truth for others, um, no matter who they are, that we might love our neighbors and even love our enemies, knowing that you loved us while we were yet sinners. You loved us by dying for us. Let that transform us, heart, mind, soul, and strength. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.